Welcome to the Pediatric Emergency Care Coordinate Resource Series. Uh, uh, this is a collaboration between the pediatric committees of both the Massachusetts Emergency Nurses Association and the um, uh, Massachusetts American College of Emergency Physicians. Today's speaker is Nikki Staples. She is a, has 20 years plus experience in emergency and critical care in the rural or suburban and ur urban setting. She recently commit, completed her master's in public health practice, um, focusing on the uh, commercial exploitation of children during her practicum. Welcome, Nikki. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me in this series. It's been such a pleasure to collaborate with both ENA and MASAP, and I hope you find this information as valuable as I did when others took the time to share it with me. I've been working uh, in emergency departments in both community and teaching institutions for a few decades now, and one of the most challenging patient populations to care for, for me, has been our behavioral health friends. Their challenges can't be fixed with a cast or sutures, and their care requires understanding patience and empathy, things I have not always shared in abundance. I wish I could go back and give this lecture to my 24 year old self. A few years ago, I had the good fortune to work with a child protection team at a teaching institution in Massachusetts and I completed an internship with a forensics nurse named Laura McGuire. And during those months proctored a lecture given by Dr. Heather Forkey. Dr. Forkey is the chief of child protection, um, the chief of the child protection program and knows a thing or two about childhood trauma. And her lecture was focused on the ACEs study and how trauma impacts the developing brain. I'm not understating things to say that this lecture has forever changed how I care for kids who are seemingly out of control. The lessons I learned in a few short hours have made my job of caring for dysregulated children and adults, frankly, much easier and more satisfying for both myself, my patients, and their caregivers. I hope you feel the same as I share some of those same lessons with you today. So the original ACE study was conducted at Kaiser Permanente here before I graduated from nursing school uh, with two waves of data collection. Over 17,000 HMO members from Southern California receiving physical exams, completed confidential surveys regarding their childhood experiences and current health status and behaviors. All ACE questions referred to the respondents' first 18 years of life and prevalence of ACEs was organized by categories. Those categories included emotional abuse. Did a parent or adult in your home swear at you, insult you, put you down? Physical abuse. Were you pushed, grabbed, slapped, hit so hard you had marks or were injured? Sexual abuse. Were you touched or fondled in a sexual way, made to touch someone else's body in a sexual way? Did anyone attempt to have sexual intercourse with you? Did you witness abuse? Was your mother pushed, hit, threatened by a father or boyfriend? Was a household member a problem drinker or did they use street drugs? Was a household member depressed, mentally ill? Did they attempt suicide? Did anyone actually commit suicide? Were your parents ever separated or divorced? Neglect, was there someone in your family that made you feel special and feel loved? Did you feel close to each other? Was there someone in your family that could take care of you and protect you or were your parents too drunk or high to care for you? ACEs are common across all populations, and almost two-thirds of study participants reported at least one ACE, and more than one in five reported three or more ACEs. The ACE scores the total sum of the different categories of ACEs reported by participants, and study findings show a graded dose-response relationship between ACEs and negative health and well-being outcomes. In other words, as the number of ACEs increases, so does the risk for negative outcomes. And as you can see, the likelihood that one of your pediatric patients or your adult patients has experienced toxic stress from one or more of these adverse childhood events, it's more likely than not. So now that we know a whole lot of our kids are experiencing toxic stress, let's take a look at what that stress response means in terms of neurobiology. When someone experiences stress, the amygdala, an area in the brain that contributes to emotional, not logical processing, sends a distress signal to the hypothalamus. And we're going to come back to the amygdala in a few slides, and not just because I like to say amygdala. Um, when we experience a stressful event, the amygdala sends a distress signal through the hypothalamus, which activates the sympathetic nervous system by sending a message through the autonomic nerves to the adrenal gland. These glands respond by releasing the hormone epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, into the bloodstream. 
Epinephrine triggers changes to include a faster heartbeat, which pushes blood to the muscles, heart, and other vital organs. The blood pressure increases. Bronchioles and the lungs dilate, allowing us to breathe more deeply and rapidly, enabling the lungs to take in as much oxygen as possible, because that's what we need if we're going to run away. Blood is diverted away from the GI system so that reserves can be directed to body systems that will allow us to run fast or to punch hard. Fear also triggers the sympathetic nervous system to release higher levels of cortisol in the bloodstream. And all of these physiologic changes allow us to be more alert, sight, hearing, and other senses sharpen. Epinephrine also triggers the release of glucose and fats from temporary storage sites in the body, and this supplies energy to all parts of the body, allowing one to flee, hide, or bite more effectively. These systems, they're not designed to operate under constantly stressful situations. And some of our kids, they fear for their safety 24 hours a day, seven days a week, some of them for their entire childhood. And when, and when the stress system remains activated all the time, we can see why so many of these kids grow up to be adults who are more prone to diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, uh, long-term lung diseases and other um, diseases. So what does that mean for your patient? It means they literally can't calm down. Over time, high levels of cortisol start to wear down the brain and other body systems. And this damage has been associated with depression, anxiety disorders, addiction, memory loss, and dementia, as well as other morbidities, which we just mentioned on the last screen. And cortisol in high concentrations is in itself damaging to biological tissues and can affect the stability of the new brain circuits as they're forming. The brain becomes less sensitive to the effects of cortisol, which makes it harder to shut down our stress response over time. And toxic stress during early periods of development can affect brain circuits and hormonal systems in a way that leads to poorly controlled stress response systems that will be overly reactive or slow to shut down when faced with threats throughout the lifespan. <clears throat> okay, so here, back to the amygdala again. Uh, the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus are needed for learning and problem solving. So we refer to that as the thinking part of our brain. But stress and trauma trigger the amygdala and the hypothalamus, which is the feeling part of our brain. Um, persistent reliance on the feeling parts of our brain mean that over time, they become more dominant, literally. And the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus can shrink or reduce in volume. And this is associated with poor declarative memory and impairs a child's ability to learn, to be calm, to think, and to respond flexibly to stressful situations. I remember very early on in my career, I would call myself a new nurse. I was taking care of a six-year-old little boy who by the age of four had truly suffered from unspeakable trauma that I, I can't even um, repeat to this day without being a mess of tears. But he had just failed his third foster home placement and his social worker had been tasked with the unfortunate well, he'd been tasked with the unfortunate position of having to tell this little boy that he wasn't going back to his foster home. So he brought him to the group home, sat him down in a room and said, you know, hey, buddy, you're here to live here from now on. You're not going back to your foster home. And that six-year-old six little boy who was small for his age after years of neglect hurled a full dresser of clothing across the room because that was his stress response to this really unpleasant information. So his amazing social worker brought him outside, safely away from all the other children in the home. He let him tear his jacket off, stomp on it, throw it in a mud puddle and scream his little head off because in that moment, that's, that's what he needed to do to calm down. And that's, that's the only thing he knew how to do to calm down. So once he was a little calmer, he brought him to the ED where I taught him how to play solitaire for the rest of the night shift. And at some point he did casually reach up and pull the fire alarm, which I still remember 19 years later watching in slow motion, um, but super, super sweet kid who really had a lot of trauma in his life and, and needed to scream. But we, 
be the healthcare providers have to remember that so many of these kids we take care of have been in situations where no one has been there to help them develop healthy coping skills. And they're probably, they're not gonna say please and thank you. They may appear to be very out of control because that's the only way they know how to cope with stress. And that's the way their brain is literally wired now. So when these kids come to us for care, we really have to adjust our expectations to whatever's going on with them in that moment and set goals that these kids can actually achieve. If a kid comes in screaming because he's just been rejected from his third foster home and he needs to scream, I'm going to let him scream. Um, okay, so kid comes to triage and we decide that they're not safe. So first of all, how do, I, how do I identify an unsafe child? So EDs are required to screen for suicide risk, and there are various tools available that allow us to briefly screen for suicide as part of our standard of care. One such tool is the Ask Suicide Screening Questions, or the ASQ, which has demonstrated a sensitivity of 93% and a specificity of 43% to predict return ED visits with suicide-related complaints six months from the index visit. So that means 53% of patients who screened positive, 237 out of 448, did not present to the ED with suicide-related suicide complaints. So it's really important that we ask those questions. Even when someone presents for a hangnail, we still have to screen them for suicide risk. If they refuse to answer the questions, that's considered a positive screen and we need to implement safety precautions and just assume they're suicidal. Um, and I know every ED is a little different, but we talk about safe environments. So you have to put that patient in a safe environment. So what does that mean? Well, it probably means I'm taking away all of their electronics. I'm taking away their clothing. I'm taking away their shoes. Where I work currently, we provide green paper scrubs. Um, but if you don't have that available, you just need to provide them with clothing or have their care provider bring something in that can have drawstrings or ligature risks, things that are stretchy, things they can't deconstruct to ultimately cause harm to themselves or someone else. Uh, we need to make sure their room is safe. A lot of places like to use garage doors because that allows you multifunction of the room and you can keep all your medical equipment behind the closed door. But if you can't do that, you can pull all the equipment out. You can zip tie cabinets closed. You can zip tie monitor cords um, and, and wind them up so there's no ligature risk, ligature risk there. Um, what else? I like to take trash bags out of the room, keeping in mind that some of our friends stay with us for days, so it's nice for them to be able to dispose of things. So if you're going to put um, a trash can in the room, make sure there's a paper liner in it and not a plastic liner, which can be used for suffocation. You need to think about meal trays, and if the patient can have utensils, um, you know, a plastic, typical plastic tray can be used and has been used as a weapon. Can they even have utensils or do they just need finger foods? Don't put aluminum cans in the room. Those have sharp edges and can be used to cause harm. Be really thoughtful with hot liquids. Hopefully you have a report with your patient or you got a handoff from someone so you know if they've uh, been respecting boundaries and making good choices where you give them hot cocoa. Um, and let's just think about this from the perspective of a, like a 12 year old boy, for instance, who's coming in and expressing suicidal ideation. We're taking away all of their belongings to include clothing and shoes. We're putting them in a small windowless room and seating a stranger who is an adult and think about their history with adults and the only possible escape room route they have from that room. We take away their phone, which is always traumatic. Uh, their only means to communicate beyond that confined room. And we do these things because we have to, because our first priority is always to keep them safe. But we need to be mindful that this is really scary. We're taking everything that they derive some security from away from them. And we're seating a stranger in the only exit they have. Um, and what do these kids know about adults so far in their life, right? They can't be trusted for the, you know, some of the kids we take care of certainly have caring involved adults in their life, but a whole lot of those kids don't. And the adults they did have in their life who were supposed to take care of them, put them in harm's way or couldn't take care of them. Um, so interventions, ERs are chaotic, loud places. And we try to give kids that are dysregulated a quiet environment, but we can't always do that. So that means that you, 
you, their healthcare provider, have to be that place of calm. And you have to be very mindful about your tone of voice and how you modulate your voice. You have to be very mindful of your facial expressions and your body language and make sure that you and your presence isn't confrontational because the ears are loud and they're gonna hear all of that. So every interaction with this kid, you really need to harness your patience and be calm and reassuring for them. Um, I've stood in hallways and watched healthcare providers stand in doorways of escalating kids. And, and they stood there with good intentions and lectured them on their behavior and told them, you're being disrespectful. You can't speak to me this way. That kid doesn't care. I mean, they're, they're in a place of trauma and a place of stress. Um, and they, they're not going to treat you with respect. And to ask that from them in that moment is probably only going to make them more upset. So your job, your priority when a child is escalating is to do and say what you need to do, one, to keep them safe, but also to de-escalate the situation and lecturing them on what kind of person they're supposed to be is not going to help the situation. At least I've never seen it help. So I just wanted to talk for a few minutes um, about a 15-year-old girl I took care of recently, actually, that presented with an intentional overdose. I think it was day four when I took care of her that she had been boarding in the ER. She'd been medically cleared. Um, I had received a report that uh, her suicide intentions were very real uh, and that we had to be very careful with everything we gave to her to include therapy putty, which I'm pretty sure she had tried to eat at one point. Um, so she was very serious about causing harm to herself. And the other concerning point was every, almost every time she ambulated to the bathroom, she would try to elope. Um, mom was in the room. I didn't know a whole lot about her past history, but in these situations, I, I just default to the assumption that something traumatic has happened to these children. Uh, so I went in and I introduced myself. She was in a safe room wearing green scrub, scrubs. Mom was in a chair. She was on a stretcher. The garage door was shut. The room was safe. She had a care companion sitting in the doorway. Uh, and I, I just said, hey, I'll be with you for the next 10 hours and what about my business? And shortly thereafter, someone let me know she had to go to the bathroom, because of course. Um, so I went into the room and I said, hey, here, you need to go to the bathroom. So my understanding is that every now and again, you try to leave when we do this. So I'll walk you to the bathroom, but it's going to be you. It's going to be me. It's going to be the care campaign and it's going to be the security guard. And we're all going to walk there together. Um, and when, when we're done, we're going to walk back to your room and I need you to go back to your room because if you don't, the consequence of that will be that we'll have to put a commode in your room because I need to be able to trust that you're going to come back to your room when we're done. So off we went, flanked by all these people. I kept the door open a little crack to give her some privacy. She went to the bathroom, washed her hands. I thanked her for washing her hands. We all walked back to our room and sure enough, just as we were outside our room, she chose to keep walking. So I had to physically put myself in front of her and gently physically move her back to her room. And this is really up to you as a care provider. Not everyone's comfortable putting hands on anyone and bringing them back to the room. She really wasn't resisting me. I had security with me. So I knew if things escalated, they would intervene. Um, I was able to get her back in the room <clears throat> uh, and Mom was still in the room. She stood right in the door, very confrontational in front of me. My care companion was next to me. Security was behind me. And she just continued to escalate, screaming, saying, I don't belong here. You're not helping me. I want to go home. I don't need to be here. Um, and in these moments, it's really important to identify someone to communicate. I think human nature is such that we all have this overwhelming, compelling need to talk and try to fix the situation. We tend to all talk at once. Um, so in this case, the care companion had been with her longer than I had, had a really good rapport with her, and just, I let him talk. I let him say, hey, you know, we've had a great morning so far. We really need to stay safe. We need to figure this out now. What can we do to help you? Like, what can we do to make you feel better right now? And she just kept saying, nothing, nothing. I can't, I can't calm down. Nothing's going to make me feel better. I want to go home. Um, and she continued to escalate. And mom at that point had stood up. And as mom stood up, she grabbed the chair, picked it up, and just heaved it at the care companion, who thank goodness saw it coming and was able to deflect the chair. But this is that moment when my patient 
doesn't have the ability to stay, stay to stay safe anymore. So I have to figure that out for her. So we called our rapid response. I'm blessed to work in a place that really has a very robust security team. So when we do that, we get a, a lot of security guards that come all at once in our first intervention when we have to restrain a child is to do hand, physical hands-on restraints. So in this situation, we got her on the stretcher. I done I did a comfort hold till everyone arrived. She like thank goodness really wasn't fighting too hard to get away from me. Um, and each of the four security guards took a limb, and a fifth security guard just remained back to really observe the entire space. Mom was still present, um, and she was she continued to swear at us and yell and scream. You don't understand. I don't need to be here. On and on and on. Um, and really was, was fighting against the restraints. And I noticed, you know, the room became very loud and we were all talking um, and looking and saying, hey, do you have this and do you have that? And it just became a lot of clamor. And the thing that stopped us was her. And she just all of a sudden said, shut up. Everyone needs to stop talking. And we all were like, oh, okay. And we shut up and we stopped talking. And at that point, mom, who was a really calming presence, really just started to rub her temples and speak very soothingly to her. Because this kid knew when she got to that point, she couldn't calm down without help. We watched her calm down a little bit. And eventually I chose to speak and say, okay, we're gonna let go of your right leg. I need you to not kick anyone. Because if you do, we're gonna have to hold your right leg down again. So the security guard let go of her right leg. She cooperated. Okay, great job. Like you have to be sure to reinforce positive behavior no matter how silly it seems. You're doing a really good job right now. We're gonna let go of your left arm. So we went ahead and let go of her left arm. And again, I set the expectation. If you try to hit anyone, we're gonna have to hold your left arm again. So we went through that and we could visually see her calm down um, until we were all very quickly able to back out of the room and leave her like she still wasn't happy, but she was back in control and safe again. Um, and I have to say in the course of that shift, this happened again and we went through the same thing. We did it a little better the second time. We're a little bit more mindful about not talking too much because that clearly was a, a trigger for her. But this is absolutely a kid at some point in the day who I said, hey, I, I, I get it. Once you get to that point, you can't can't calm down. Thank you for telling me that. So if you need to yell, you go ahead and yell. If you need to take that pillow and hit the stink out of that stretcher with that pillow, because that's the only way you can feel better right now, you do it, but you can't hurt yourself and you can't hurt anyone else. Okay, so that's my case study. I hope it's helpful. That was pretty typical on something we see pretty often, but at the end of the day, I just really appreciated this quote, treating people with dignity is the first act. And this is um, narration from the dog entry series that's coming out about trying to undo the bias around mental health called the me you can't see. So as you leave this series or this piece of this series, I hope you just keep in mind that so, so, so trauma in their life, over 65% of them have experienced an event. You with dignity because people haven't always treated them with dignity and frequently just haven't treated them with dignity at all and put them in harm's way. So it's really about us to set the example for them. And again, we need to adjust our expectations and really set goals that are achievable for the kids sitting in front of you. And that's gonna be different maybe for every child, but you have to keep your bar someplace where they can actually meet you at. Um, and that's really it for today. Thank you for joining us.